Okay, so we've already talked about some of those political reforms, and can you remind me, are most political reforms happening at the national level or the state level? The state level. Did we talk about the one that's happening at the national level? Good, here it is, maybe. Um, oh, did we talk about that guy? His name is Robert LaFollette. His name is over here. No. His name is Robert LaFollette. Uh, he is the senator turned governor turned senator from Wisconsin. Uh, he is a major proponent of progressive political reform. He's also going to be a big deal when we get into um, the debate over whether or not the Americans should get involved in World War One. So he's an important figure you're going to want to kind of keep in mind. Um, and so he really is encouraging of things like um, the primary system of developing political reforms and so on. Uh, but the big national reform that we've got for politics is another constitutional amendment. And if you're keeping tally of those things the populists wanted that they ultimately got, um, here's another one. Because the 17th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is in fact going to provide for the direct election of senators. The progressives want more control over politics. They don't want the businesses to have all the power. The populists wanted the same thing. Together, they're going to be successful in pushing for Congress to both pass and the country to ratify the 17th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Will you remind me what the 16th Amendment was all about? The national income tax, right? Um, and one of the things I don't think I mentioned yesterday, uh, but if you're like fishing for a way to memorize stuff, because there's a lot of things to memorize, uh, if you sort of kind of draw your six like this and put a little one right there, it kind of looks like a percent, which is kind of like a tax. This is a percent of your good luck. Okay. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so there you go. So the 17th Amendment is yet another example um, of a progressive uh, sort of success that builds on the populist uh, work before. All right, so we're going to change the subject again, uh, and we're going to look now at some moral reform. Gentlemen, uh, we're looking here at one of the big campaigns of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. That's what WCTU stands for, Women's Christian Temperance Union. And I will have a gentleman tell us how effective they think this particular campaign would have been. Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. <laughs> Anybody feeling like that was a hugely motivating campaign? Anyway, we shouldn't make fun of these 19th century. <laughs> Bring on the liquor. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so remember, what is the hallmark of progressivism? They're called the Women's Christian Temperance Union, but what is the hallmark of progressivism? Legislation, right? So very quickly, we're going to move from temperance to the passage of the 18th Amendment. We're on now progressive amendment number three. We have now tied Reconstruction and the end of slavery for amendments to the Constitution. It's a pretty big deal. So the 18th Amendment is going to ban the sale, purchase, transport and production of alcohol. It technically doesn't ban drinking alcohol, so that's not actually a crime. I mean, the idea is, like, if you were already in possession of alcohol when the 18th Amendment was ratified, you know, like, maybe you'd saved a bottle of wine from your wedding or something, that it should continue to be legal for you to drink it. But um, you just can't buy it or sell it or make it or move it from where it was. So that's the idea. The 18th Amendment will be backed up by a law called the Volstead Act. We backed up by a law called the Volstead Act, and the Volstead Act is going to be sort of the enforcement mechanism. So the Volstead Act is going to say, okay, so the agent bans all this stuff. Now the Volstead Act will tell us how are we going to provide, um, you know, like um, enforcement. Are we going to, you know, where are we going to do raids? What will the punishment be if you're caught with this? How are we going to implement or enforce? Are we going to have? They do allow, interestingly, alcohol is still allowed to be used for medical purposes. So a lot of people got some prescriptions for. <laughs> Um, interesting concoctions, right? Uh, anyway, so that's the 18th Amendment. We'll get to this later when we come back to when we hit this in the 1920s. And um, we'll talk about some of the effects of prohibition sort of longer term. Uh, but I will tell you this, um, at sort of bare minimum, prohibition is effective in reducing the amount of alcohol that's consumed in the country. Now, you've all read The Great Gatsby. I don't think you're under any illusions that people stopped drinking alcohol. Um, <laughs> at this time, but here's the deal. It's kind of like how marijuana is illegal. You know, people still smoke it. You shouldn't, don't do it. Drugs are bad, just say no. But, um, but people do still, right? They use drugs.
drugs of all kinds, right? Um, on the other hand, if marijuana were, le were legal, do you think more or fewer people would smoke? More. More, because it would be legal and easier to get and probably cheaper and there would be no risks associated or at least fewer risks associated. You get where I'm going with this, right? So although we know, and we'll talk more later, about how prohibition doesn't end alcoholism in the United States, it does significantly reduce the amount of alcohol being drunk uh, because it makes it more expensive and harder to find. Um, okay. Changing the subject again here, uh, we're going to talk now about the rise of the women's movement. Um, so I've got on my board here, um, back, remember, what was the last time we heard of the women's movement? Seneca Falls, 1848, Second Great Awakening, nod your head, you're with me? Good. And it all kind of fell apart when? When was that? The 15th Amendment, right? The 15th Amendment is ratified. It says only male people get the right to vote, and that was really irritating for women. And they got really mad and kind of broke up into different sort of organizations. So at that time, in the 1870s, the women's movement really divided itself. Um, and we ended up with the NWSA, the National Women's Suffrage Association. They were all this time trying to get a national amendment. They wanted um, to change the US Constitution to allow women to vote across the country. But another group of women formed the AWSA, the American Women's Suffrage Association. And instead, they thought that a better approach would be to go state by state. Try to get the individual states to change their own constitutions to allow women in that state to vote. And they'd had also, the American Women's Suffrage Association, they'd had some success. Many states in the West, Colorado, Robert LaFollette's Wisconsin, um, Oregon, these states do allow women to vote, right? So women are voting um, in some states way before they can vote as a nation. Jeanette Rankin, I think, is the first female senator. Maybe she was a representative. I should know that. Anyway, uh, she was in Congress before women could vote in most parts of the country. So there is some success in the state-by-state -state approach, but not, they're not making much progress at this point. So in 1890, um, the two groups merged. They decided they'll be better off if they work together. So now we have the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which is pronounced NASA. Um, and the National American Women's Suffrage Association, they're going to be led by a woman named Carrie Chapman Katz. Um, she is very pragmatic. They are focused on a national approach. They're going to try to pressure the U.S. Congress um, to pass and then encourage ratification for a national amendment. And sort of working as their foil is going to be Alice Paul, another woman you're going to need to know about. Alice Paul leads the National Women's Party, the NWP, and she is extreme. Uh, she is going to be leading um, demonstrations like this one, where during World War I, right, Americans fighting against, you know, whatever, tyranny, who knows, um, they're going to stand in front of the White House with signs that say Kaiser Wilson, as in Kaiser Wilhelm, the leader of the Germany who we were fighting in World War I. So they are extreme. They do these big protests and demonstrations. If you've ever seen, it's kind of, actually, it's really old now, but HBO a long time ago, maybe a decade ago, made a movie called Iron Jawed Angels. If you like historical fiction, I really encourage you to watch it. Um, it's not even really fiction, uh, but obviously it's been fictionalized. Anyway, it's the story of Alice Paul, and she's arrested. She's, um, she was on a hunger strike while she's in jail, um, and then she's force-fed, which is this sort of like violent um, process, and it talks about sort of how uh, that experience went. Anyway, so with Alice Paul kind of serving as a like, I'm not going to let people forget about this information, right? We're going to keep this in the public eye. We're going to be radical. And then here comes Kat and Nasa um, you know, being all like, look. You should do this. It's good for us. They use arguments that are very progressive, very second grade awakening, very separate spheres in nature. Remember, what was the idea of separate spheres? Men and women are different but equal, right? That, that, they're, that, that women are not inferior to men. In fact, in their homes, women are superior to men, right? And that men are superior in the public sphere. And that, remember, if you'll remember, back to the second grade awakening, that argument was used to say, therefore, Women should be teachers. Therefore, women should be helping in prisons and asylums. Therefore, women should be, remember that, nod your head? Okay. So in the same way, women are going to use this kind of argument, right? What do the progressives want? Well, they want to clean up the food supply and educate children and take care of the poor and the hungry and help to make everybody more moral and so on and so forth. Doesn't that sound like stuff that's right up women's alley? And so women are going to be lobbying progressives saying, hey, you want more votes for your reforms? Give us the right to vote. We will vote with you. 
didn't exactly turn out that way, but uh, that's what the big argument was, right? That the women's vote will help to encourage this progressive vision of America, that they will be voting alongside male progressives. And just sort of as one last caveat, I want to remind you that again and again we're being reminded how do disadvantaged, discriminated, oppressed people get rights in this country? They do it by convincing somebody in the majority to let them in, right? It's not usually successful to fight your way in. Um, it doesn't usually work, hasn't worked in American history very often. But by convincing the majority, ours is the moral cause, ours is a good cause to fight for, that's how it's worked. Okay, so now let's think about national politics. Um, to begin, don't forget this guy, Eugene V. Debs, he's still running for president. But the wind has been taken a bit out of his sails, right? If the country is like hugely divided, this giant wealth gap, rich and poor, and the industrialists have all the power, socialism sounds kind of appetizing, right? I mean, it's like, oh, you know, that could be a good idea. Cool. Like, there's no other way to end this horrible world order or whatever. But on the other hand, when the progressives begin making reforms, when we begin to see some incremental change, when we begin to see conditions improving because of progressive reform, the idea of socialism becomes less attractive. So socialism is still a thing. Eugene B. Debs is still around, but less important. Okay. Uh, then we do want to know, and this is a little bit strange, that political participation actually declines um, in the progressive era, which doesn't make a huge amount of sense, and I think has some interesting ramifications for us today, right? Like we have all of this activism, all of these interest groups, all of these protests and organizations, but but broad-based political participation, in terms of voter turnout at least, is actually like, was pretty low. People don't turn out to vote, even though there's all these things to care about. Um, and I think one of the interesting things to see is that like, when we see government kind of working, when we see people doing things and like reforms being made, it's easy to kind of sit back and go like, well, I don't really need to be involved. I kind of take care of it. Um, and it really sort of takes crisis moments um, to invigorate people and get people to kind of get back on board um, and for it to turn out to improve. So it's sort of interesting to see. Um, you might have thought the progressive era would encourage more political activism since it was like partially focused on increasing people's access to government. But in reality, um, turn out decline. Okay, let's talk about Teddy Roosevelt. In the beginning, did Teddy Roosevelt like set out to be a progressive president? He did not. He called all those gosh darn journalists muckrakers, right? Just digging up muck and they're messing everything up. But he's also a politician, as most presidents tend to be, and um, was sort of encouraged by the idea, you know, this progressive stuff is pretty popular. So he really sort of branded himself as a progressive president. He was all about trust busting. He was all about conservation. He was all about, um, you know, reforms for the workers. He was all about doing those things. Um, and so then when he leaves, he, so he serves actually just one and three quarters of a germ. Um, he was the vice president for William McKinley. McKinley is shot in 1900, 1901. Um, and so Te uh, Roosevelt serves out three years of McKinley's term and then he is elected on his own right. So he serves seven-ish years. Anyway, but he decides he wants to retire. He wants to go off hunting in Africa. Funnily, um, one of the senators, this guy named Henry Cabot Lodge, makes this comment when Roosevelt announces he's going to go hunting in Africa and says that he, he hopes that some lion would do its duty, as in he hopes that Roosevelt will be eaten. <laughs> when he is in Africa. They weren't friends. Anyway, um, so Roosevelt's going to go off and he's going to retire and he sort of sets up his vice president, Taft, to be the new president. So he helps Taft get elected. Roosevelt is very popular with progressives. And he kind of hopes that Taft is going to carry on his legacy. Taft is going to keep doing these progressive -y things and keep the country going in the direction that Roosevelt liked. Well, the thing is, Taft is much more conservative than Roosevelt was. He is still a progressive. Taft, for example, will actually bust more trusts than Roosevelt did. Um, unlike Roosevelt, Taft isn't all about this good trust, bad trust stuff. He's going to just bust trusts where he sees them. So he really encourages breaking up of major trusts. Uh, Taft will continue a bit of the conservation efforts, but there is very little new legislation under Taft, right? Whereas Roosevelt, well, you know, there was the Meat Inspection Act, and there were the patent medicine, the FDA was created, and then we've got uh, the Department of Labor being created, and we've got this, and we've got that. There's not nearly as much going on under Taft. He's carrying on, he's continuing policies that exist, but he's not innovating. Well, Roosevelt is really irritated about that. Uh, oh, I forgot, this is Taft's bathtub. And for reference, this is at the Taft Presidential Museum. Uh, that is a fully-sized human being in the background. It's a large tub. Yeah, oh, he's the heaviest president we've ever had. He got stuck in the White House bathtub like one of his first nights in the White House. And so, because he was too large, so they, he got a new bathtub. Uh, yeah, so that's like a fully-grown human being. Anyway, 
Uh, okay, so uh, so Roosevelt is going to come back. Teddy Roosevelt will come back. So he leaves office in 1908. Um, he, you know, Taft serves for four years. Roosevelt feels like Taft isn't doing a good enough job. So Roosevelt comes back. He tries to run for office again, right? He wants to have now a third or second and a half term. Um, but now, what do you think happens? Do you think all the Republicans, Taft, by the way, and Roosevelt are both Republicans. Do you think all the Republicans love Roosevelt? Or do you think some of them might have liked Taft? He's a little less crazy, a little less... Innovative, feel a little more predictable. So, what do you think happens to the Republican Party? Splits, right? The sort of the establishment Republicans actually pick Taft, which really makes Roosevelt angry. He's like, "What do you mean you're big the Taft? You know, I'm like way better, and everyone likes me best." So then Roosevelt forms his own party, the so-called Bull Moose or Progressive Party. I want you to pause for a moment. Throughout this whole time period, we've talked about his Progressive Era. Was there a Progressive Party? There was not. These are people of all parties working together for reforms they like. It's not until 1912, when there's part of this split in the Republican Party, that we see the, the, the creation of the Progressive Party, that, which uh, Roosevelt mostly calls the Bull Moose Party. So Roosevelt creates this Bull Moose Party. And then we've got Woodrow Wilson, who's a Democrat. He's an academic. You guys know how people criticize Obama for being like too professorly? Yeah, Wilson was way worse, like by 100,000 million times. He was crazy smart. Um, and knew a lot about almost everything and was very intellectual and people, like, everyone felt like he was talking down to them. So he's not a super popular guy. But when the Republican Party is dividing its support in half, who do you think wins? It is Wilson. And so Wilson will win in 1912 and his platform is new freedom. New freedom. And you should read in your book about what new freedom means. Another thing we didn't mention that I want you to make sure you focus on your book is um, President Roosevelt's uh, plans, sometimes they call them the three C's, conservation, consumer protection, and I always forget the other one. Uh, anyway, uh, but you'll want to look through uh, to get some of the details on their presidencies. But we are done with progressivism. We're going to write tomorrow. Um, there we go.